Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, we are happy to see you here on Thriving Thursdays. Um, this is our last Thriving Thursdays for July. Um, it's been a really successful month, really honoring and observing uh, POC Mental Health Awareness Month. So as you come in, as you come in, just share your name in the chat, where you're calling in from, and something that made you smile today. Again, Thriving Thursdays is brought to you by InnoPsych. It is our way to engage the community around mental wellness and mental health by showcasing mental health professionals and mental health advocates who are really making a difference in their community, who are bringing positive messages about mental health and mental wellness, and making sure that people understand what are things that they can do to thrive and to heal in their lives. So Keith Masco, um, I met Keith about, I don't know, over 10 years ago at this point. Uh, um, as I worked at a, our high school, Keith was doing some uh, collaborations with some of our students and some of our, our teachers there. He is an actor with a, a degree from UMass Boston in theater arts. Um, he um, has awesome act, act, uh, acting credits, most recently um, for lead and role in Confused by Love. He's also played doubles with um, Chris Rock in Grown Ups and Grown Ups 2. Um, he's a founder of Front, Front Porch Arts Collective, which is um, um, a group that really brings um, theater to, to um, I don't know if it's just Massachusetts based or, or is it national? Um, in uh, that's Massachusetts, Massachusetts based right now. Uh, okay, great. Right. right now. So, you know, big things coming. Um, in 2017, he launched Triggered Life, which is a one man show that explores his past with sexual trauma and reconciling with his identity. Um, I was able to see and witness that wonderful performance um, and just also very vulnerable in you being able to share that part of your life with your audience and, and with your community. community. Um, he recently just launched Living a Triggered Life, which is a podcast he started with his wife, Roxanne Masco, who is a social worker. Um, welcome, Keith. And let me just um, see what else I have here. I think that's all we want to start with for now. So let's just get into the questions. So I, um, Keith, I love starting with purpose and really hearing kind of what, what got people into doing the things that they're doing. So tell me a little bit about what drew you to acting. Um, well, uh, first of all, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this is such a pleasure uh, for uh, many different reasons. One, just to be asked to, to come and talk. Two, the fact that, that you are Bayesian, right? And we're both doing this work. We're able to collaborate. It's just exciting to me. Um, of course, I had to cl collaborate also with Kwame Dance. He's also does this work um you guys more professionally than me but it's just exciting to me to have a division talk about mental mental wellness yeah. right and that are helping people because that's just something that wasn't talked about as much in my household right and in general so that that's that's exciting to me um but in terms of acting, one second. your um connection is a little choppy is it like that for other one or everyone you other people janelle you're hearing keith clearly is that my is that my audio? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if it's hold your on. mic or yeah. Yeah, hold on a second. Because I have the headphones. Sometimes, sometimes it gets choppy with the headphones. Am I okay. still choppy now? Yeah. Am I still choppy. Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on. Let me let me try and uh, take these off and see if that's going to be better. Hold on. Okay. How about now? Much much better. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. We'll All right. It. We'll forget. It. Um, but in, but in terms of like my purpose is uh you know when I wanted to be an actor, um of course in Beijing culture and everything storytelling is big, yes. huge, huge, yeah. and so that always that always excited me. I like doing the invitations of my father dancing, <laughs> um, and you know one time we were in Christ Church and um we had we were taking a picture outside my aunt's house. And the person next door's goat got into the picture, <laughs> right? So the woman said, you want to take a picture of my goat? You got to buy me goat. 
right? <laughs> so that was always like hysterical. So yeah. it always type of impressions and things like that. And so I knew I wanted to become somebody. I liked becoming somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so that's what that's what drew me to that's what drew me to acting um, in general. Great. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And um, one of the, I love the story. You know, the storytelling and laughter is so much a part of our culture, right? It's like you know, the jokes, you know, they're like, you've heard them 10, 20 times. Right. They, they laugh like it's, you know, the first time they've said it. <laughs> every, time, every time is like the first time. Every funny story, it doesn't make a difference how many times you've heard it because sometimes it's told a little different. Yeah. Every yeah. single time. So yeah. it sounds new. So it just, yeah. you know, that yeah. was just around. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was really drawn to that. Right. Who is the storyteller in your family? Um, we had, we had a couple, um, my, my grandmother on my father's side, on the masculine side, for mm -hmm. sure, was a great, was, she was really great with how she told stories. Um, my grandfather, uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, you know, some of my cousins and stuff too. Like, yeah. this is, it was a whole bunch of folks. Yeah. Um, and, uh, my, one of my great aunts on my mom's side, yeah. uh, she had, you know, she had the, the smooth, uh, gravel Bayesian voice. Yeah. And so when she yeah. told the story, you really cap, you really captivated. It is. Yeah. You know, she was, she spoke a little slower mm -hmm. and then she quick and then she'd go quick. So you had to make sure to, to pay attention. Pay attention. So, yeah. 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 My, our storyteller was my aunt, uh, mm -hmm. passed away about, um, nine years ago now, but man, she could tell you a story and you're, like you said, you're just captivated and right. she would have you in tears and stitches. You would be right. back. Um, so, and, and her, her oldest son, he's kind of, he's our storyteller, you know, and it's funny how it does get passed on through the genes. It does. But, yeah, right. It's great. It does. It does. And it's what, you know, it's kind of what, I think also what is, you know, carry us, carried us through. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Time. Yeah. Is that, is that, that storytelling, you yeah. know? So you kind of alluded to, um, you know, I've, some, I've talked about this a little bit for those who've joined in before in terms of the Barbadian culture and, you know, in terms of the perception of mental health and, and seeking help. So, you know, I'd love to hear your perspective, kind of, you know, expand on that a little bit more. How did, how do people see mental health? You know, what were the messages that you got either growing up or even as an adult about mental health and, and, and emotional wellness? Right, you know, like you know, something that wasn't something wasn't talked about that much, right? It was almost like, you know, what well, him over there, you know, he ain't right, right, right. Like it was always alluded to it, right? But never really talked, never really talked about it. something that was kind of tucked. Right. But also in general, in terms of what our business was, there was a secrecy. Yeah. Right. You didn't want other people knowing what your business was, right? Mm -hmm. I always talk about like. You know, I was the gatekeeper when I answered the phone for my parents and everybody was a bill collector, right. everybody. So everybody had to be screened <laughs> before they could, my parents would come to the phone. So it was like, you know, so it was, you know, silence in a lot of ways, yeah. right? Secrets in a lot of ways. Um, and so no one talked, no one really talked about it. Wasn't the point of someone talking about going to therapy, like that was, no. That was what? Right. right. That was no. That was for white people, boy. That's what that was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um those messages, you know, those messages, you know, they stuck with me for sure. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Um yeah. and there were some challenges. There were definitely challenges in the family that I saw and things like that. And I did see how because they weren't dealt with, how they played out mm -hmm. and the collateral damage that it had on the rest of the family. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I got caught up in, in some of that. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that kind of what led me at some point to have to, you know, take the best of my Bayesian roots, mm -hmm. take the best of it, and, but also have to redefine my manhood as well. Right, yeah. Yeah, that secrecy and, um, excuse me there, that secrecy is very, very tough. And it was, uh, it was also, there was a secrecy, but there was also this aspect of, 
not talking to children about things. Yes. yes. So like you either you had to eavesdrop and try to piece things together. Right. I remember right. having an uncle who stayed with us at one point and actually had two uncles with significant substance abuse. Mm. And nobody talked about I mean it was there and present in like in full fledged. Right. Nobody talked about it or processed it with you or right. It was always then you don't do, you know, just the don't, right. Right. but no understanding about why or where is this coming from or, you right. know. Right. Because there's a whole thing about, you know, what, you know, what, what my, what our parents' story was, right? We, the, we were only told certain parts of the narrative, right? Yeah. So, but I always thought of like, looking back, I was like, wow, well, were they protecting us for something or were they protecting themselves? Right. You know what I mean? Because, right. you know, part of part of the way that, you know, us as, as Caribbean folks and black folks and Africans and whatever, how we've been able to get through is by tucking. Yeah. Right. By tucking yeah. and moving on mm -hmm. and, and doing that. But right. certain, sometimes that doesn't work for certain people yeah, in certain exactly. families. Exactly. And you got to make a you have to make a different you have to make a different decision. Right. Um, but. Yeah, some things just were not, yes, some things were not, not explained. You know, you were at the kids' table, and you were at the kids' table for a reason during, you know, Thanksgiving and stuff. You, you know, if you made it to the grown-up table, that doesn't mean that you still talk. Right. You can't like, still not ask any questions. Yeah. But you're just there. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about um, the triggered life and the tr triggered, and then that turned into a triggered life, and now living a triggered life. So tell us about how that came about for you, how doing the play came about for you? Uh, well, I got involved in a, a, a project, uh, a, a short movie um, called, uh, a short movie called Red Monster. That was how I was dealing with mental health and also with uh, black men and sexual abuse. And the man, John Adekoje, bringing me, bring me in, who was also works with me in the project, yeah. bring me in on the project. And, and um, actually, I would say um, Martin Pierre, who mm -hmm. um, wrote that script, um, or one of the, the writers, is a psychologist, mm -hmm. and he's actually currently the president of the Massachusetts Psychological Association. So I just wanted to mm -hmm. add that piece in there. Right. No, no, no. Right. No, I was going to get to that, but thank you. You're out okay. of <laughs> All right. I'll wait. I'll just, I'll stop. No, no, no. no. You can't forget that part. Like, you, that's an important part. It's history. So. We got to make sure that we that we tell those stories. Yeah. So, um, so I got brought into that project, um, and of course, because I was a survivor of abuse, I was moved, you know, to be a part of that. And you know, I said that I, my wife Roxanne, who's a who's a social worker, psychotherapist, we're always look, we were always looking for ways to combine the art mm -hmm. and social work and mental health and things like that. So we really got excited by it. I play the abuser in it which of course is another another challenge and right, stuff right. and um you know i was i was very curious about what else was going to happen with the project so we sat down we talked about it and so we talked about doing a one man kind of a one man piece uh that could be used kind of as a learning tool and stuff like that so um and had you, been open, had you been open about your own story your own abuse prior to i've been, I've been open i had been open about that i had been part of my story um mm -hmm. but as we were developing it with with john adeko it got to a point where he wanted balance and so he came to me and he said i need your story and i had already been writing in general about mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. and so it seemed like i didn't question it Right, because I have full trust, of course, in, in John. John is uh, amazing. But yeah. And so, you know, I gave him my story. Mm -hmm. And so we started to develop, we started to develop the show. The show. With two grants in the Boston Foundation, we started to develop that. And so we had the two characters. One represented, uh, you know, for brothers who can't speak and haven't spoke, spoken yet. And then it was my character where I told my story. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was really, it was a really incredible experience for us to do that. But there was more to do. Once I started to speak and talk and see just uh, the response and the effect, I knew there was more work to be done. 
And so that's when we developed the Triggered Project. And so we went from just doing the show to now saying, okay, what else can we do? Mm -hmm. So we went to doing the show, to doing workshops, to doing, um, to having uh, a resource page for folks who are looking for uh, mental health clinicians of color, right. um, you know, in Boston and resources, but also across the country, yeah. um, even in terms of sexual orientation and everything else, we have that. Um, and then from there, I said to my wife, I was like, look, people are always asking us how we've been in this long-term relationship. I started to tell, we've, I've already started to open up and talk about this. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about it is my wife works with me and is a lead clinician. So she's involved in the, the trauma-informed talk back that we have after the show and things like that. So I said, look, we're going to do a podcast. We're starting on Monday. And that was <laughs> Thursday. And she said, what? I said, don't worry about it. I'll tell you about it on Sunday night. <laughs> so it was important for us to talk about what it was like to be in a relationship and be triggered. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that? It was never anything that I've heard anybody even talk about right. before. Right. And I felt like it was another part of my story and our story mm -hmm. that we could share. Mm -hmm. One, because we need to share, but also because we felt like there was so many other people that are in, in that situation and that's never talked about. Whoever talks about that, right? You guys can talk about, oh, she tripping or like, what's wrong with him or whatever, but like not really understanding that what is going on or taking a second glance mm -hmm. or thinking about it and saying, okay, wait a minute. Like what, what's really going on? Because that's the process that we've had to take with each other. Right. If you navigate being in this relationship and being triggered all the time. So that's, that's kind of, that's the short version of how, that mm -hmm. how things, um, how things evolved. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as I've been doing this work, right, I'm also speaking for my family, right? Mm -hmm. Five out of my, my favorite, five out of six of my favorite cousins all were abused on one side. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not even talking about the other side, right? right? And so it was important. I felt like it, was, it started to become more and more important for me to do more. More and more people started to disclose for me. There were so many people around me who disclosed. Um, and uh, I also could see in, you know, Bayesian culture, West Indian culture, and Caribbean culture, how this is run rampant. And yeah. I felt like, well, why not? Why not us? Mm -hmm. Why not us to talk about it? Why not, why not try to connect the dots? Because there has to be some other people who are having the same conversation. Right. And how important it was for the, you know, the regular community, the Bayesian community, the black and brown, like everything. Mm -hmm. And it was, I could also see the collateral damage that it was having on black and brown men. That's not talked about. Tell us, yeah, talk a little bit about that. What, what, so people are, you're sharing your story. Yes. And naturally that vulnerability allows other people to be vulnerable with you. Mm -hmm. um, and how are you, I'm sure you get hearing a lot. So how are you one dealing with the stories that you're hearing? And then how are you turning this into what you've developed over time in terms of, you know, I don't know if you went into acting to be a mental health advocate, right? <laughs> I don't think that was necessary, <laughs> right? Well, but I, you've become, you've evolved into this other right. role. Yes, so. but, but I think also too, I've always, you know, now I look back at different roles that I've played mm -hmm. and I've, I'm always playing roles where you're forced to be vulnerable, number one, two, where there has been some type of trauma that hasn't been talked about. You know, I look, I played, you know, in the Color Museum, I played five, five roles, but I played Miss Raj, right? And folks who may, may know what that is, um, you know, there's a lot of trauma there. You know, some August Wilson stuff, there's trauma there. Mm -hmm. In The Dutchman, there's trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, even in Confused by Love, there is still 
there's trauma there. Anything I've done with John Adekoje, there is most definitely. <laughs> if you guys need to look him up because he's excellent. Yeah. But any of his projects, there's an element of dealing with trauma and pain. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, th I think that I've been always gravitated to those roles. Um, and making sure, one thing is important is I try to put, you know, I'm, I'm in therapy and been in therapy for, for about 10 years. Um, I try to make sure I have to have my wellness in order. Yeah. Um, you know, but I've had some health problems and, and recovering from, you know, some complications from shingles for the last few years. So I've really had to try to navigate my health through, <laughs> you know, through all of this. But taking these stories that I've heard, they go back into the show. Mm -hmm. That's why that second character is, for, is represents, you know, uh, is a composite of some interviews, but it's turned into more of folks that can't speak, mm -hmm. not folks that won't speak, mm -hmm. folks that can't, that just cannot speak, mm -hmm. cannot get to the point mm -hmm. of actually the acknowledgement Mm -hmm. and actually say the words and I understand that because I was at that point for a long time right, right. and you know it's, you know we've talked a little bit about my own history but when you've held a story for, for a long time it just gets harder to open up and right. it kind of creates its own you know energy around it right 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 most definitely it was something that I just didn't want to I didn't want to face you know at all you know and i got abused by two people one one of them i talked about the other one i did it mm -hmm. i didn't face it i didn't want to do i didn't want to do i didn't want to do anything to even point me in that in that direction right. right you know what i mean like it was it was just that it was just that okay. deep yeah. because if i had to if i really had to think about it and i really had to deal with that you know what was that going to mean for my relationships mm -hmm. right because of the family. So right. what, 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 what does that mean? Yeah. You know, it's a really, it's a really tough thing. And, um, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing. And I don't expect people to disclose. I don't expect people to talk. I don't take that for granted, mm -hmm. but you know, I've had men tell me you're the only person I've told mm -hmm. ever. Yeah. I've never spoken before about this until this moment. Of, of saying to you, me too, mm -hmm. right? And, um, or realizing it as well, because, you know, it was a female that was involved. Yeah. And so that was, that's been a lot of the, a lot of the discussion um, with, with a lot of the folks um, is that, is that realization. Mm -hmm. And so we, we put that back in, we put that back in, uh, back into the show okay it's great powerful very powerful thank you for sharing that and what are you seeing in terms of so two people are sharing your, your are sharing their own stories but what do you think the impact is of having that show and um the different pieces where you've expanded it what do you think that's how that is that impacting the community and men and women as well in terms right. of right right um, um I mean, it's been, I mean, to be honest, it's, it's, a, it's a really humbling thing. Um, but, you know, I've had people just come up in and say, thank you so much because you've put words to a conversation that I needed to have with my partner, mm. right? It's unbelievable to have, you know, partners to listen to the podcast together mm. and to start a different conversation, mm -hmm. right? I've had men, you know, talk to me about and tell me like, wow, like, I want to be better for, because I had to make that decision, right? Mm -hmm. I had to be better for myself. I had to be better for, for my partner, right? I wanted all of that, and I had to make the decision that I needed to seek some, some help, right? I got to a point where, where it just wasn't, it wasn't good. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that I shared that story, other people have just come and just made these comments about, I feel comfortable now as a male or whomever that, you know what, it's okay that it's okay that I, that I try to get some help alongside with, along with mm -hmm. figuring out what my wellness package looks like, right. you know, with our meditating, 
whether I'm playing sports, whether I'm doing arts, like all these things um, to try to figure it out. And that has been, I mean, and that's been absolutely, the response of the show was amazing. But even more the podcast now, uh, people of, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly humbling. It's really incredibly, incredibly humbling to feel, you know, like you tell your story and it's inspiring other people to heal mm -hmm. and to have meaningful conversations that, in their words, that they never ever would have had or even thought about. Mm -hmm. So um, we're hoping that we're open to this, we're hoping that this is not just, this is a national conversation and a world conversation. And if we have a little something to do with that, right that is that that's a blessing awesome so i um thank you miguel posted a ch um in the chat please if you have comments or questions please post them and we'll take them as we go along um miguel shared that um keith came to a program at utech i'm not sure where that is um no. and and men many of the men just started to disclose including himself um their own story so I think, you know, having someone that looks like you or comes from a background like you that's able to share and put that out there, I think it is very, it is humbling and it is, it, it takes away a pressure, right? Um, and I think people want to share their story. They just don't know how to start that conversation. Right, right, right. How, right. What is the first word that I say to kind of unburden myself? Right, right. Uh, hey, Migs, uh, I think, and UTech does really great work. And what does UTEC stand for? Can you tell us? Or yeah. Miguel, can you tell us? Can Miguel, can Miguel, can you tell us? Yeah, because right, yeah. he, can, he can explain it better than me, but you know, that show was in front of former Bloods, Crips, and Latin Kings. Miguel, welcome. Yeah. Hello. How's it going, y'all? Sorry I came on late. Okay, <laughs> you're here. It's been a, it's been a long day. Uh, yeah, so UTEC um, it, it used to stand for United Teen Equality Center. It's an organization that was started by youth because there was a lot of crime going on in, the, in Lowell. They needed a safe haven. They combined themselves with the street workers program, which operated outside of, inside of the city hall at the time. And both of them went from one location to another location until they have the location that they have now, which they've been in for the last six or seven years which yeah. is a workforce program that works with disenfranchised and um, proven risk youth. That means that they meet three out of the four criteria, which is they've been um, uh, a survivor of violence, have committed violence, have been incarcerated, and um, are most likely high school dropouts who are parents as well. Um, mostly men. And um, yes, yeah, so there's a lot going on in UTEC. Um, and I wanted to add that one of the key things about this whole work is that um, a lot of the rape crisis center, I, I work for one as well, called the Center for Hope and Healing in Lowell, we don't have men of color um, who are counselors. Um, so that has been some of the challenges. Um, so having Keith is, is definitely a great thing. Nice. So UTEC stands for what again, Keith? United Teen Equality Center. That's what it used to stand for. It doesn't stand for that no more because okay. they work with um, young adults who are older than teenagers now. Okay. But the brand um, was so strong in the community that they decided to keep it. And they just use UTEC. Got it. Okay. Right. Where, and this is a group where? that works with um, young people in Lowell, Lawrence, and now Haverhill recently because of the crime rate there. Okay. Um, so they're working with about 100 young people throughout the year who have been majority gang affiliated coming out of... Um, um, prison and they have a lot of stories mm -hmm. of sexual violence um, that has happened to them. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. So that so that's how your some of your and thanks to Miguel for highlighting that. That's some of the impact that your work is having. That is astounding. That's really cool. And um, so in terms of the living a triggered life, the show that you do with your wife, um, I'm really intrigued by that because it's funny. I've started using even with my husband, just naming my triggers. And we're actually reading this book called The Mindful Relationship, mm -hmm. um, which is helpful. Um, but it is, you know, helping me to just name, like, when you say something, <laughs> and like, because our bodies just respond. 
and we, you know, you know, we go from zero to 10 or whatever it is. Um, and then the other person has no clue. And then they're just responding to this response that they just got. And then you, you're done to this full fledged argument. You're like, how did we get here? Right. right. About nothing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. That's, I mean, and that's, and that, right. That's, I mean, that's the stuff we, that's the stuff we break down. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You hear in, in one of the, one of the future episodes, we actually are on our way to, uh, to the studio and we were, we were having this discussion. And so I just said, don't say anything else. And of course I got to look. And I said, please don't say anything else. And I still got to look. And then we processed it live. Mm. We talked about it. And I really, we honestly had an honest conversation as soon as we started the podcast. And like, well, this is what we were supposed to talk about today. We're not talking about that. We're dealing with, we're processing live something that's going on between us right now. Hmm. And we're just going to have the conversation. Wow. That's, that's modeling in the moment. And because you don't know where, where that's going to go. So. Right? No, no, no. And that's, I mean, that's the whole thing. Like, you know, like we have a, we know what we're going to talk about and stuff like that. But um, it's a free flowing conversation. Mm -hmm. Like what, this is not like nothing is staged and that's what we wanted. We want this, we want it to be a hundred percent authentic. Mm -hmm. You know, we stay on topic, of course, mm -hmm. but that's what, ha if you re if we're really going to open up, yeah. I mean, we're not going to, we're, we're going to do it to help people. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go, we're going to go as far as we can, mm -hmm. you know, and Roxanne is, Roxanne does not hold back. You yeah, know, she's, she's awesome. really, really, she's really brilliant mm -hmm. um, in this. Yeah. So yeah, please folks, if you have questions, um, I'm just going to read a comment. Um, Alba, thank you for sharing. My husband and I have been working on naming my triggers also. Mm -hmm. uh, my abuser was Dominican. My husband, who's Dominican too, was triggering me. And I was afraid to tell him. Once I did, he was so open and accepted. And my triggers and I was liberated. Right. Triggers in relationships are so important to talk about. Alba, yeah, right. totally agree, right? It's like... Yeah. Sometimes you don't even know, right? Because it's so part of who you are. Right. And when we name them, we start to be able to separate them from us, right? right. We can name it's a behavior or something that's happening, but it, it's not integrated with our identity. Right. So, right. And that's and then also too with with, with Caribbean men, and I I include I include Dominicans in that, right? Mm -hmm. Like the fact that you could have that conversation gave. The, the husband the opportunity to be vulnerable with you mm -hmm. right probably in a different way that maybe has happened before mm -hmm. and that's incredibly and that's incredibly powerful mm -hmm. yeah it's incredibly powerful yeah you know and that is such a liberating moment to be able to to, to be able to do that but then also have the discussion about how to kind of figure that out and it may not work because it may be different every single time <laughs> But the fact that you can have that honest conversation right. is, I, I, is, that's just special. Yeah. And, and it can be received. And it can be received. Because sometimes yeah, it can be right. received. Exactly. Right. And I, like you said, it's, um, you talked about earlier, Keith, it's like, how are we then redefining masculinity as well, right? In this, um, yes. you know, growing up in Caribbean and, you know, um, you know, as said, my dad is like, you know, very, you know, that, idea of you know i'm right what what, what i say is, is gold and bond and right. the only way yes. and and, yes. and also that comes with that the promiscuity and all that stuff and so yeah. um how are we defining um masculinity um, right through sharing our stories and being vulnerable right right no that's well said and you know i've been saying this a lot is you know the all the things that i learned about we were taught about being what it took or what it was like to be a man were all the things that I had to, that were all in the place of my healing. Mm -hmm. mm. So I really had to mm. go. Wait, say that again. Say, say that again. Cause I don't think I got it, but I think I got it at the end. So say that one yeah. more time. So all the things that I was taught about being a man were all the same things that we're in the way of my healing. Yes. Right? So if, right? So I have a graphic. Mm. Right? I know everybody can see this, this yeah. graphic that I made. Right? But what it says is, these are also a lot of things that I heard. Right? 
or don't mind him. He's just sensitive, right? Man up. Being tough is what women want. Stop crying like a little girl, mm -hmm. right? You let your girl tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. Boys don't cry. Mm -hmm. Therapy, that's for white people, mm -hmm. right? And here's more of a new one. Light up, man. It'll make you feel better, mm. right? And another one is, you a punk if you talk about your feelings. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the messages that I learned as a male. Mm. So I had, to, I had to fight through all of these right. to get to a place for me to even start healing, right? I had, to, I had to figure out what type of man I wanted to be because that wasn't working. Yeah. That wasn't working in my relationship. That wasn't working anywhere for me, right? Mm -hmm. So I had to go against Everything. probably the, even the family's definition of what it, what it, what it meant to be a man. Mm -hmm. And so that was a really, that was a really, that was really, really tough for me, mm -hmm. you know, because there were men in my family that I really, that I loved, that I respected. Those were my people. Yeah. But I had to make a different choice. Mm -hmm. and that was that was difficult yeah that was difficult in a, in a lot of ways you know but like i said i had to take the best of what i was how i was trained right because you know west indians and caribbeans we get trained yeah you don't get raised mm -hmm. so i had to take the best of, of what how i was trained and then leave some of the other stuff yeah. right because i will never like when things are tough I go back to my vision and teachings. Here, mm -hmm. I fall back on all those great things, right? And I can and I can live in those, and leave and leave some of the other stuff and be okay with that. Yeah. Now I can be okay with that now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's so yeah. interesting that you mentioned that, Keith. As, as far as like you know, I, I'm listening to this conversation and. I had been through so much trauma as a young child, like maybe um, at the age of eight, like my mom was a drug addict, mm. I had experienced, um, I, had, um, I had been a witness to like verb to verbal abuse, physical abuse, drug use, mm. sexual abuse, everything. And um, I was put into a foster home um, and my father like immediately stepped in and, you know, took custody of me, he was a single dad, like less, you know, younger than 30 years old. Wow. And I always tell him the one thing that saved my life, I believe, that made me this resilient person that I am today, was my father always said to speak my mind, to talk about everything. And man, oh man, like that literally saved my life. Because as an eight-year-old, I had so much inside of me. I just mm -hmm. didn't even know how to express it. I was very quiet. Um, just the normal, you know, normal behaviors of a traumatized child. Right. Uh, but at like eight, nine years old, like my father got me. I never went to therapy, but mm -hmm. he got me a diary. Um, I was able to have that open communication with him. Right. And like that was a savior to me. Mm -hmm. Like that literally saved me. And now I have a 13 year old daughter and a little baby boy. And like with my daughter who's 13, I'm like, we got to talk about things. Mm -hmm. You got to call me out on things. And I'm constantly asking right. her. And I know because of my tr past trauma, I'm always asking her, like, did any, like, always, and it, it may traumatize her, me asking her these questions, but, like, just checking in with her, like, did anyone make you feel uncomfortable, did anything, you know, I don't let her spend the night over people's houses, like, those are things that, right. you know, a traumatized child, like, I'm not letting you spend the night over anyone's house, because I don't know what's going to go down there, so you're going to be home, and she, you know, right now, she's like, well, I don't have any friends, so I can, like, go visit, I'm like, well, I'm sorry, I, you know, you got to make friends, you can make friends from a distance, <laughs> but anyway, just to go back to what you're saying, like, I think, as a traumatized person raising children and with my father, the, the advice that he gave me of just open and honest about everything, I think as adults and as parents, I think we should probably do that same thing with our children is to keep the lines of communication open. Yeah, yeah. So true, so true. Thank you. Is it Roshana? Rosanna? Roshana? Roshana, yep. Roshana. Um, and, you know, I connect so much with that as being a parent as well. and. Sorry, the wind is blowing really, really hard. Um, and not wanting to pass on our trauma to our children because it, you can do that so easily. And I, you know, I have to be mindful um, of that. And um, 
you know, I, you know, I experienced sexual abuse as a child by someone who was a little bit older than me. I didn't know what was happening. And the, you know, it's like, so I know she was abused, like in reflecting on that, she was abused too. And those things that, you know, that pass on, no one talks to you about it. And, but, you know, when my kids are playing, like, I have to be mindful, like, because I get triggered. It's like, are they okay? But I talk to them as well. Um, you know, we read books about your body and I'm always talking about, you know, this is your privacy. No one touches you in those parts. And, you know, how do we empower kids to understand their bodies right. and also protect them, right? So how do we give them a language? Because I didn't have a language to say this is right. not okay. Right. And so how are we given a language, but also not traumatizing them, right? You know, how are we giving them information? Right. I think it's so important, yeah. Right, that balance, like trying to take that balance, right? We're going to be hyper, we're going to be hypersensitive. We're going to be hypersensitive in right. some way. But that does it, yeah. And it's, you know, and it's, it's, it's tough, you know, it's, it's tough, right? It's tough right now, you know, cause I have, you know, I have two God kids that I'm close to and definitely um, my little vision by your niece, you know, you know, we're, we're somewhere and stuff. And I'm like, okay, what you, what's she wearing? You know, like, you know, but then I just have to, I get them just caught like, okay, like, no, that mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. remember, that's is that, that's my inner child, right? right? That's right. my inner child that I had to check really right. quickly. Right. Right, because right, you, like you said, that intergenerational trauma that has been passed. Right, we're making the conscious decision not to pass it. Right, right. We're breaking. We're breaking that chain by having those conversations that you're having, mm -hmm. Doctor Jackman and Madonna, that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Right, but we still have to process how to actually deal with that. There's right. still more that we may have to do with with our inner child for us to be better with how to navigate that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Because that's 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 really that's something that's really important. Something that Roxanne talks about and stuff is you know traumas trauma our trauma is like our kids, and they grow up with us, mm -hmm. yeah, right, and they and they get older with us, but you know we still have to do work with them. Mm -hmm. Because they're still, they're close, still close to, they're close or still, still the same age of when we got abused. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, it, so it's, it's important that we have those conversations uh, with ourselves and, you know, and seeking help and stuff like that too, to, to help really navigate that. Yeah. Yeah. I love, so the, um, and I'll move in, I'll ask you one, we have a question here, but the photo that you showed us that looked like your inner child so tell us a little bit of was that an exercise that you did or tell us a little bit about how you came up with that um i i saw i saw something online that wasn't anything uh particular but it was a boy and then all these crazy things around it and it made me it made me just made me think right and it felt like i said i've been dealing with you know some some complications from shingles and nerve pain and stuff mm -hmm. and so i had to try i was just trying to create differently Mm -hmm. And so the idea came to me and I was like, oh, wow. Like, what are all the things that, you know, I had to, I had to fight through and what were all the things that shielded me, right? Because there's two parts of that. There's two parts of that graphic as well. The other part of it is, is what is shielding, as I call him the little boy, but he's really, you know, the inner child. You know, what are the thoughts that are shielding him, right? Being, being tough is dealing with your emotion, right? These are the thoughts that I was having. Mm -hmm. You know, expressing my feelings makes me strong. Strong is talking, is strong is taking responsibility for my mental wellness, mm -hmm. right? Asking for help is showing real strength. Mm -hmm. Self-medication only numbs the pain, mm -hmm. right? And crying is a way to let go of the pain. Mm -hmm. So these are, these are the things, and finally it says, I will define, I will define my own manhood. Yeah. Ooh, I love that. Right? And so, because that was my process. And so somehow mm -hmm. it, just, it just came to me what it was. I started mm -hmm. with the outside, and then I thought about all the thoughts that I wanted to have, what I wanted to have and wanted to talk about, but didn't talk about, because I couldn't get past right. what was on the outside. Mm -hmm. And so um, I felt like it was something that, 
we could use during like our workshops that I do with Roxanne and, 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 and you know, with uh, young people and all, even men about mental health in general. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been doing a, kind of doing a group with, with Kwame with, you know, West Indian men and have used the slide for full discussion. Yeah. Full discussion, full hour, hour and a half discussion and unpacking. Yeah what this what this what this what this means yeah to, to is, each person. yeah that is great and you got to write that up because that is something you know we talk here about what are strategies what are things that you find healing and that you can share and i think that is definitely something people can connect to it doesn't have all the cycle babble is real and it gets to what we need to talk about right yes so i've, I've written it i started to, I've, I've written it up and there's a curriculum that 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 uh that i've been working on okay um with that nice, nice so um and then figure out also how to you know combine art i'm working with the boys to men program in cambridge right now which uh about 17 young black and brown men uh young men and we're doing inner monologue work mm. to get them to to talk about what's going on right now and just the feelings in general mm -hmm. um and then you know, there'll be a performance piece, but we're also going to take part of their words from their monologue and other words that define them that they haven't shared. Mm -hmm. And we're going to paint them on sneakers and protective masks, right? right? So there's another way of, you know, yes, sometimes you wear, you wear it on your sleeve, mm -hmm. your emotion, but we're going to wear them on protective masks and sneakers because mm -hmm. that's a political statement, right? right? Right, to be able to do that. But also the political statement is, for us as black and brown people to take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's first and foremost, that's a political act yeah. within itself. And as people look for change, that's the first step, right? Because how are we gonna try to get to these second and third steps if we haven't dealt with our stuff, right? And it gets in the way, even if we're a leader, it gets in the way of everything, right? So that's, that's what we can do. That's what we can do for ourselves is make sure that you know, that our wellness is in check, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And that uh, the people that we're dealing with and our family's wellness is, is in check and there's power within that mm -hmm. alone, mm -hmm. right? Because mental health system in general isn't set up for us. Right, right. Right? I and know, I always say, um, therapy might not have been made for us, but doesn't mean we can't make it work for us. Right, right. And that's what's, you know, that's what's important about, you know, nationalization of black social workers and, and black psychologists and whatever, because, you know, and, you know, this is it's like Latinx and everything else, because then you can combine, then you can bring the real culture into it. Right. And yeah, I've transformed, you know, what I learned, like I've had to adjust and make it culturally relevant for my exactly. people. So. Right. Exactly. And I've heard, you know, even from the work that you did, you did at, uh, you know, Aaron's shop and, and stuff like that, like that work right there. Mm -hmm. The fact that you mm -hmm. were able, like you have, like you were able to make that culturally competent mm -hmm. for us yeah. Yeah. had, had was, was huge. You right. know what I'm saying? I heard about it. So big, <laughs> oh, up, to you. big up to you, Beijing. Big up. <laughs> this is a, um, um, a local um, hair salon. And she has a program she works with a community organization that brings in speakers every month um, to talk about topics impacting women. And one of the ones is about mental health. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I am just like just a champion of just finding people where they're at. Right. Um, but we're almost running out of time. This has been such a wonderful conversation. I have to get into one more piece and then I'll let you go. So one of the things we talk here, this, the theme of this month has been about finding your sweet spot. Right. Yes. And as we talked at the beginning, right, you know, with all the pain, there are always these stories and laughter at the end of the day that people kind of gather around and build community around. Yes. And um, the other quote that I use is uh, Maya Angelou's quote. Um, she talks about the great perversity, the irony of life is that in the struggle lies the joy. Right. And so always about regardless of what painful moments we're having, how are we still connecting to joy and finding those spaces where we can have self care and can exercise that political act? Um, yeah. So I'm going to share with you um, my screen here. Mm -hmm. 
so let's see here. So these are, um, this finding my sweet spot, finding your sweet spot are based on some cards that I developed recently. And um, they're based on mindfulness, building a strong, uh, resilient mindset. And how are we also remembering that our bodies and our minds are interconnected? Often we just act as though these are two separate um, parts of us that, that have no connection. You know, I think that's how we're raised, right? Like, you know, you don't talk about your, your feelings and your emotions as if you can do that, right? right? But our bodies tell our stories and it's so important to listen to our bodies and know that how that connects to our emotions and our feelings. Right. So I'm gonna have you look at these 10 and you're gonna choose, I'll have you choose one that you can't live without, mm -hmm. or maybe two, two that, you, that are part of your daily practice or part of your, your self-care, your wellness routine. Mm -hmm. um, and how do you use this to also just connect with joy and, and, and find in that happy, those happy moments, despite whatever things you might be experiencing. Right, right. Um, I think uh, share your story is a big one for me. Um, because I just, I, I think it's bigger than me, yeah. right? This work I'm doing is bigger than me, right? So that always keeps me focused and grounded. Mm -hmm. Always, mm -hmm. always. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's probably the probably the first one. Mm -hmm. um, speak up is something else, especially when you've been silenced a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But not speaking up just to speak. Right. You know, really going through the process of, okay, I would like to say something, but do I need to say something? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do I need to say something now? Right. Right. But the fact of having the opportunity to speak up and knowing that I do is a cool thing because then you don't always have to say stuff. Mm -hmm. You right. don't feel like you always have to because sometimes, yeah. you know, as a survivor, we, we got, you know, we got to talk all the time. I don't have to. Mm -hmm. You know, I probably won't talk for the rest of the day after, today, <laughs> after we get up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, the other thing, I mean, this, of course, like say spirituality and thing, that's always part of it. Um, but I think the other thing is, is kind of success driven, but not success in what, in what people may think of success. Mm. The importance of telling the story, the importance of telling my story, the importance of trying to help other people mm -hmm. mm. is what, what drives me in a lot of ways. Yeah. And you know, putting the energy into the air and whatever happens, happens, right? So, um, and just understanding the importance of that is kind of drives me. Like that is, if one person is, if one person is affected, I, I am blown away by that. Mm -hmm. I am humbled by that work, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. right? Um, but I understand that it is thankless and mm. it's something that, um, kind of, there's always work, there's mm -hmm. always work. Mm -hmm. And that, um, that, that, that's a, some people might take that as a pressure. I don't necessarily, mm -hmm. um, but I understand that taking care of myself is part of that. Right. Yeah. And so that, that, that grounds me, that grounds me in a, in a lot of ways. That's awesome. So I'll encourage folks, if you want to drop in the chat, what are one or two of, you, of your um, strategies that helps you connect to your sweet spot um, as we wrap up here? Um, Keith, this was amazing. I just appreciate so much your, of your time. And I know that you were, you're not feeling 100% today, but I just appreciate you just being here and spending this hour with us and sharing your story and sharing your, your laughter but also sharing how you are healing a community through your art. And I, you know, we talk about a lot with the kids at the high school about you know, kind of artist activists, right? We're really promoting using your art in service of something else. And you're, this is such an example of how you've been able to take your art form and create healing for people on a significant issue that people have been silenced on for years or, you know, and be able to come into a space and use that, you know, just, it's just powerful. And I just appreciate 
the work with Triggered Life, the work that you're doing with your wife to also now you're also healing, helping to heal couples, right? In relationships and marriages through this and, and families. So I just, and I'm in awe of your work and just thank you for that. And thank you for spending this time with us. And I look forward to thinking about how we can work together. So just really yeah. powerful. Yeah. Yes. No, thank you. And you know, like, you know, like I said, the, the fact that, you know, you vision, I vision, you know, that that gives me energy, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And we, you know, we keep pushing true as, mm -hmm. as, as, as my grandmother used to say. So, um, you know, that was great, but I want to make sure that everybody knows how to, uh, yeah. you know, how to find, find me and stuff like that. So, you know, I put in, uh, in the chat, the, uh, our website, uh, for the project in general. Um, but the podcast, Living a Triggered Life podcast, you can find on, you know, iTunes and, um, Spotify and iHeartRadio, um, and Stitcher, um, in Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and things like that. So, nice. you know, please support us. Um, and I'm gonna be, we're going to be dropping uh, a special interview uh, in the next couple of days. So there'll okay. be some more. There'll be some more. There'll be some more stuff uh, coming. So please listen to it. You know, Dr. Jackman, I would love for you to listen to it. You know, with hubby. You know, he has to make sure that, that you're wearing it, wearing your hat, and he's wearing his hat. <laughs> yeah. Um, We'll no, definitely do that. We'll definitely do that. We'll definitely do that. So yeah, right. I know we're out of time. And if people want to stay connected with um, InnoPsych, this is how you connect with us. Um, Gina, you want to drop our info in? Um, but yeah, thank you. And we'll be back again um, with Thriving Thursdays. We're going to take a week off um, next week, try to get fully into summer mode and um, taking some space back to really bring some more programming. But thank you again, Keith, uh, for being here. And thank you, everyone.